When Sue Ellen Roberts, 31, and her daughter Lexis K. Roberts, 12, left their Las Vegas, Nevada home for a road trip to Arizona just before Labor Day weekend in September 2010, their friends and relatives assumed they would return home by the end of the long weekend. When they didn't, concerned family members contacted local police to report them missing. Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department provided their assistance, according to KTNV News, but it was not long before the case involved police from multiple states and jurisdictions. According to what relatives told the police, Sue Ellen and Lexus had made plans to visit the Grand Canyon as well as the Barazona Wildlife Park near Williams, Arizona, and relatives believed they had been traveling with Sue Ellen's new boyfriend of two months, Thomas Stephen Sanders, 53. Relatives immediately suspected foul play in the unexplained disappearances. It's not like my daughter just to turn cold and leave and not call me in so many days, Mary Woodburn, Sue Ellen's mother, and Lexus's grandmother told a reporter with Action News 13. I think maybe he did something to my daughter, and now my granddaughter is with him alone. All I want is to hear their voices and know that they're all right. Family members told police that Sue Ellen and Lexus were believed to have been traveling in Sue Ellen's silver 2001 Kia four-door sedan with Nevada license plates. The car had noticeable damage on the passenger side. The Coconino County Sheriff's Office, CCSO, in Flagstaff, Arizona, tracked Sue Ellen and Lexus to a motel in the county and determined that they signed the motel's guest book on Saturday, September 4, 2010, and were last seen the next day visiting the Arizona Wildlife Park, where surveillance video showed them entering the recreational drive through area. From there, however, the trail went cold, according to CCSO Sheriff's investigators. While Arizona investigators did not rule out the possibility of foul play in the disappearance, they were not anxious to embrace such a theory either, and instead said that it was possible that Sue Ellen and Sanders had run off to begin a new life together, a theory the family did not accept. A nationwide all-points bulletin was soon issued for the missing mother and daughter, including their descriptions and photos. Sue Ellen was described as white, about 5 feet 4 inches tall, weighing 160 pounds, with brown hair and blue eyes. Lexus was described as white, 5 feet tall, 100 pounds, with brown hair and brown eyes. Investigators soon learned that Sue Ellen had been born and raised in Manchester, New Hampshire, according to the New Hampshire Union leader. Lexus had been born there too, but had left with her mother for a new life in Las Vegas when she was 4 years old. At that time, Las Vegas was booming and attracting large numbers of new residents each month. Sue Ellen's mother already resided there. Lexus attended school in Las Vegas since kindergarten and had just started seventh grade at Silvestri Junior High School on the city's southeast side when she disappeared. She turned 13 during the time her whereabouts were unknown. Sue Ellen and Lexus had lived at an apartment complex, also in the southeast part of the city, but had moved about six months before they vanished. They were known to visit family members in New Hampshire every summer, where they could reunite with loved ones and escape the intense heat of Las Vegas for a while. Sue Ellen had attended Hallsville School and Hillside Middle School in Manchester, according to her great-aunt, Patricia Cloutier. Cloutier told a reporter for the New Hampshire Union Leader that Sue Ellen had not finished high school, but later earned her GED. A dedicated mother, Sue Ellen worked at a medical supply company and tried to do everything she could to make a better life for Lexus. She lost her job, however, when the economy turned south and had to move in with her mother, Cloutier said. She just had some hard knocks in life, Cloutier added. She has a good heart and was trying really hard. She just didn't get any breaks. Sue Ellen met Sanders, her aunt said, at a time in her life when she was depressed and struggling to make ends meet after the loss of her job. Sanders saw an opportunity to get close to Sue Ellen and Lexus, Cloutier said, and began showering her with gifts of jewelry and clothing. Sue Ellen told her great-aunt about Sanders and said that he treated her and Lexus well. She was at a low point in her life and he charmed her into trusting him, Cloutier said. The last time anyone heard from Sue Ellen was on September 5, 2010, when she used her cell phone to call a relative. Investigators, of course, urgently wanted to speak to Sanders, who, they learned, was nicknamed Spider. Although they did not have anything concrete on him, they suspected him of kidnapping and believed he could provide at least a clue to what had happened to Sue Ellen and Lexus. A nationwide APB was issued for him along with Sue Ellen's car, 
which police believed Sanders was driving. Police cautioned that the car's license plate may have been removed or replaced, since it was likely that Sanders would know that he was being sought in the disappearances. He had used such tactics in the past, according to police. As investigators learned more about him, the APB was followed up a short time later with a federal warrant charging Sanders with Lexus's kidnapping. As investigators continued digging into Sanders' background, they learned that he had worked as a welder, night watchman at a mini storage facility on the southeast side of Las Vegas, and a handyman. It was at the storage facility where he purportedly had met Sue Ellen. He also collected scrap metal to earn a few bucks and was known to exchange automobiles by dealing with salvage yards. Police described Sanders as 5 feet 8 inches tall, about 200 pounds, with brown eyes and gray hair. His Nevada driver's license photo depicted him with a bushy gray beard and a receding hairline. Investigators also learned from Sanders' relatives that he has no upper teeth and only two lower teeth. He also has a scar on his abdomen and a tattoo on his chest. Sanders often went by his middle name Steve, but sometimes used Spider. When detectives looked even deeper into his history, they learned that Sanders had been declared legally dead by the state of Mississippi in 1994 after his family reported that he had vanished. According to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Sanders walked out on his first wife, Candace Tarver, of Hammond, Louisiana, and their three sons in 1987. His parents, brother, and ex-wife filed a court petition to have him declared dead so that his children could claim death benefits. He just walked away and never came back, said Robert King, an FBI agent. Sanders was originally from Macomb, Mississippi. Tarver had divorced Sanders in 1988 for alleged habitual, cruel, and inhuman treatment. Tarver was naturally shocked when federal agents showed up at her home and began asking her questions about his possible whereabouts. They also told her that he was wanted for questioning and the kidnapping of Lexus Roberts. I almost passed out, Tarver told the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He's destroyed my life, and he's doing it again. I'm worried he's going to come back here. Among the things investigators learned about Sanders was that he, despite having been declared legally dead, had allegedly ran afoul of the law a number of times since his supposed demise. He'd been involved in motor vehicle incidents in Tennessee and had been arrested in that state for possession of drug paraphernalia. He had been charged and convicted of simple battery in Georgia for repeatedly striking a boy on the back of the legs and for placing soiled underwear in the boy's face, according to court records, for which he was sentenced to two years probation and fined $500. He was allegedly involved in an incident with a child in the 1980s, but because he was never arrested or convicted, authorities refused to talk about it. His former wife, however, told the Atlanta Journal-Constitution that he liked young girls and had been discovered in a compromising position with a six-year-old girl whose father had made the discovery. That girl's dad beat the hell out of him, Tarver said. Tarver told the newspaper that Sanders had said that he obtained cuts and bruises from a hammer that had fallen on his head and had not admitted to the purported beating, but she said that she hadn't believed him. He was a pedo but not on paper, Tarver said. After being declared legally dead, Sanders became a drifter of sorts and freely moved from state to state, through Mississippi, Louisiana, Tennessee, Georgia, and Nevada. Through his tenacity, he managed to live off the grid and off law enforcement's radar until being connected to Sue Ellen and Lexis Roberts. The fact that Sanders was believed dead for so many years disturbed a number of people in law enforcement, as well as Sue Ellen's great-aunt. Who knows how many other victims he may have, Patricia Cloutier said. The more we learn, the stranger it gets. On Friday, October 8, 2010, Deputies with the Catahoula Parish Sheriff's Office in Louisiana reported that hunters had found human remains in a wooded area north of Harrisonburg. The remains could have been that of a girl or young woman due to the corpse's stature or overall length, but there was little more than a skeleton with which to work. With little information on the victim, the Sheriff's Office turned to the Forensic Anthropology and Computer Enhancement Services, FACES, lab at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge for help. FACES is funded by the state to provide local law enforcement with forensic science methods to aid in the identification of victims, especially those remains that have few identifying characteristics. FACES Director Mary Manhine and her staff, five of whom are female forensic anthropologists, 
were almost immediately moved by the case, in part because one of the victim's identifying characteristics was that of a young female. Another characteristic was that she wore braces on her teeth, according to the Las Vegas Review-Journal. I think it was the braces on the girl's teeth, Mannheim told the newspaper. It just struck us. It really just made it all too real. We're mothers, we're aunts, we're great-aunts, and we're grandmothers. We thought, oh man, this isn't going to happen. We weren't going to let this rest until we did all we could to try and find out who this girl was. Monheim and her staff promptly put together a profile of their victim. She was white, between the ages of 12 and 16. Admittedly, it wasn't much to go on, but it was a beginning. The night we found the body, we knew she wasn't from Catahoula Parish or even from Louisiana, said Catahoula Parish Sheriff James Kelly. A week later, and still unable to make an identification due to so few leads, Monheim paid a visit to a dentist and an orthodontist in New Orleans in her hunt for information, and took the victim's post-mortem dental photos and x-rays with her to see if they could help narrow the age gap. The effort paid off, and Mannheim returned to Baton Rouge with expert opinions indicating that the victim was likely no older than 13. Another week went by, and Mannheim still did not have any good prospects for identifying the girl. Similarly, local police were at a loss and had little hope of solving the case. Frustrated, Mannheim called a staff meeting on Monday, October 25, 2010. We are identifying this girl today, she confidently told her staff. Mannheim and her workforce scoured the internet, focusing their efforts on cases involving missing girls around the age of 13. Before the day was over, she learned about the disappearance of Lexis Roberts and her mother and contacted one of the Arizona detectives working on the case from there. The detective sent Lexis's dental records to Mannheim electronically, and a few hours later they matched those records with their Jane Doe homicide victim. There was no longer any doubt. It was Lexis. To go from no clue by that afternoon to getting a positive ID that night was incredibly rare. Mannheim told the Las Vegas Review-Journal. We don't normally play detective, but again, there was just something about this case that struck us. Although Louisiana authorities had known that their Jane Doe was a homicide victim, the diligent efforts of Mannheim and her face's forensic anthropologist turned what began as a Nevada missing persons case into a homicide investigation. The cops were now looking for Sanders as a possible killer and kidnapper, and authorities stepped up their efforts to find Sue Ellen, hoping that she was still alive. When news that the body found in Louisiana had been identified as Lexus and reached Arizona, residents in Williams, near the south rim of the Grand Canyon, planned a candlelight vigil to honor her memory. By early November 2010, authorities revealed that Lexus had died as a result of being shot multiple times before her body had been dumped deep in the woods in Louisiana. FBI officials in Louisiana revealed that additional progress was being made in the case although Sanders was still at large. FBI agents reported that surveillance video taken on September 3, 2010, at a Las Vegas Walmart store, depicted Sanders purchasing ammunition for a weapon that turned out to be consistent with the caliber of the weapon used in Lexus's slaying. It was not revealed how investigators had become aware of the video footage. Although Sanders was known to change his appearance, the FBI issued photographs to the news media nationwide and asked for assistance in getting his face out to the public. Lexus's family was devastated by the news of her death. Her grandmother, Mary Woodburn, said that she had cautioned her daughter about Sanders. It's beyond words, Woodburn told KTNV News. There are no words for it at all. I warned her to not go out of state with this person to check his background. You don't know anything about him. I was just concerned. This is really difficult. I'll always have an empty spot in my heart, and my heart is just like it's ripped out." Woodburn said that she was hopeful that her daughter was still alive. Sue Ellen's great-aunt in New Hampshire, however, held a more guarded outlook regarding finding the missing woman alive. Patricia Cloutier said that she did not have any idea about what may have happened to Sue Ellen. "'Her daughter is dead,' Cloutier said. The authorities are not hopeful they will find Sue Ellen alive. As investigators continued their nationwide search for Sanders, his life between the time he had been declared dead and the time when he met Sue Ellen Roberts remained mostly blank. As he drifted from state to state, he had not purchased property, and few bills were ever created in his name. 
It seemed that he may have made a deliberate effort to avoid creating a paper trail. Despite having been arrested a number of times in which he had used his real name or a variation thereof, police had repeatedly failed to make any connection to his former life. Although many people wondered how Sanders could have gone unnoticed by authorities for so long, Catahoula Parish Sheriff James Kelly told the Washington Post that Sanders had raised no red flags, in part because there is no national death database in the United States. He also was not on disability, nor was he collecting Social Security benefits, because he was only 53. It was also not clear whether Sanders knew that he had been declared legally dead. However, investigators eventually received a tip that allowed them to track Sanders to the Flying J truck stop in Gulfport, Mississippi, where he showed up on Sunday, November 14, 2010. At approximately 7 a.m. that day, according to FBI spokeswoman Sheila Thorne, Sanders was taken into custody without resistance. Sheriff Kelly added that Sanders had been alone and unarmed. Right now we have a lot more questions than we do answers, Kelly said. Kelly also said that Sanders was cooperating with investigators. It's such a complicated case, Kelly added. A dead man who's wanted for murder. All the different states involved. There are even different jurisdictions within the states that are involved. You find a body, you don't know who it is, you have nothing to go with. And two weeks later the body is identified. I was prepared for it to be a very long investigation, but the pieces just started falling together. The next day, Monday, November 15, 2010, authorities in Arizona found the body of a woman they believed to be Sue Ellen Roberts. The corpse was discovered along a remote section of Interstate 40 in northwestern Arizona in mountainous terrain near Seligman. Although Sanders was being questioned by investigators in Mississippi, authorities stopped short of saying whether any of his statements had led investigators in Arizona to the female body there. It was reported in the Washington Post, however, that federal investigators had provided Arizona authorities with information regarding where a woman's body might be found. There will be an autopsy in the next day or two to verify if it was Sue Ellen and possibly give us a time of death, Yavapai County Sheriff spokesman Dwight Devlin said. We do believe it is Sue Ellen based on evidence obtained at the scene. Arizona law enforcement sources said that it could take several days to a couple of weeks for positive identification to be made on the body. Authorities also said that it would likely require the work of forensic anthropologists, as in Lexus's case, to make the identification. DNA testing might also be conducted on the remains. Meanwhile, authorities in Louisiana indicated that they wanted Sanders extradited from Mississippi so that he could face charges for Lexus's slaying. Sanders made a court appearance on Monday, November 15th, the same day Sue Ellen's body was found in U.S. District Court in Gulfport on the federal kidnapping charge where he waived his rights to hearings in Mississippi, according to Melanie Rube of the U.S. Marshal Service. He did not enter a plea during the court hearing. Authorities in Louisiana said on Wednesday, November 17, 2010, that they will be charging Sanders with first-degree murder in the death of Lexus Roberts when he is handed over to them by federal officials. We are looking to file first-degree murder charges against Sanders in the next few days, Sheriff Kelly said. That is the only charge we have jurisdiction for. Kelly said that Sanders will be charged with murder in Arizona if the body found there turned out to be Sue Ellen Roberts. They have to keep investigating that, he said. Until the DNA comes back, we won't know for sure. Eventually, the DNA came back as a match, and Sanders confessed to killing Sue Ellen during their returning trip to Nevada from the Grand Canyon. Sanders decided to exit Interstate 40 in a desolate area of the Arizona desert. There he committed a heinous act, shooting Sue Ellen Roberts in the head and taking Lexus Roberts hostage. Continuing on a harrowing path, Sanders traveled across the country for several days, ultimately reaching a wooded area in Catahoula Parish, Louisiana. Tragically, it was there that he committed another unthinkable crime, taking Lexus Roberts' life. The evidence presented during the trial revealed the grim details of how he shot Lexus four times, cut her throat, and left her lifeless body abandoned in the woods. In the meantime, Sanders has been indicted by a federal grand jury on charges that he kidnapped Lexus Roberts. According to Stephanie A. Finley, a U.S. attorney in Louisiana, Sanders could be sentenced to death if convicted of kidnapping the child, which allegedly led to her being killed. On Friday, November 19, 2010, Sanders pleaded not guilty to the kidnapping charges, 
saying he believes he was descended from aliens. Needless to say, he was sentenced to death in 2014 for the murder of his girlfriend and her daughter, Lexis Roberts. During the trial, the judges raised concerns about Sanders' mental state and whether he exhibited any signs of incompetence. They specifically pointed out that his trial attorney did not formally request a declaration of incompetency. Thomas Stephen Sanders resides on death row in Terre Haute Penitentiary, Indiana. He is now 65 years old.